Okay, just because we have so much to talk about, I'm gonna go ahead and get started and um, everyone as they trickle in, they can kind of get caught up, but um, a few um, quick things. Uh, they, we will be answering questions at the end. Um, so if you wanna drop your questions into the Q&A panel at the bottom, we will get to as many as we can at the end of the dis panel discussion. Um, in the event that we can't get all the questions answered, we invite you all to join us um, in our new Beyond Maintenance Facebook forum, where we'll continue the discussion and answer all unanswered questions. So you can find that in the chat, uh, that link in the chat box. So welcome everyone to our inaugural Beyond Maintenance event. We're going to dig into maintenance and um, how it, the role it's playing in retaining and attracting owners. So first off, I'm going to invite or introduce our amazing panelists. First up, Garrett Wong, founder and president of Upper Edge Property Management. Garrett leads a team uh, creating systems and processes to ensure their residents and investors experience a high level of service, communication, and efficiency. Thanks for joining us, Garrett. Thank you for having me. Next up, Tim Warner, VP of Single Family Management, is joining us from Dotson Property Management. Tim plays an enormous role in setting the vision and modeling the experiences for the single family management department, which is paving the way for Dotson's growth and success. Thanks, Tim. Thank Next, you for having me, excited. Jennifer Stoops, Executive VP of Park Avenue Properties. Jennifer has served in numerous leadership roles and become one of the industry's most instrumental thought leaders. Thanks so much for your time, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. And I don't know who wrote that, but those are all live. <laughs> And last but not least, Michael Krause, partner at Atrium Management Company. In his 16 years in property management, Michael has managed over 15,000 units across 22 different states. During his time in property management, he's developed a keen eye for spotting new talent and growing Atrium Property Management, or property, ah, Atrium Management Company to the company it is today. All right. So now that you know our panelists, I'm just gonna dive right in. The industry is seeing a lot of changes. For example, the sales market is one of the strongest in over a decade. This has meant some significant attrition in the property management space, which can be great for brokerage businesses, but is a definite hit to the property management business and recurring revenue. So let's dig in to what we're doing in our businesses now to plan for the future when the market slows down. Michael, I'm gonna throw the first question at you. What changes are you anticipating as a result of owners feeling the market is too hot not to sell? Yeah, so um, honestly, we have uh, experienced probably higher than normal attrition this year um, in terms of churn. Um, so we are seeing a change in the market, um, but we've also uh, we've also experienced pretty good growth. We've, we've taken on more uh, new doors this year than we have in years past. So we're actually still able to outpace it. Uh, I don't know if that's the norm for everybody else out there, but that's what we've been seeing so far. Um, so it's changing, but um, you know, uh, it, it just seems like things are speeding up. There's a lot more movement in the market, but we have a lot of owners and investors that are also purchasing and, and buying houses. Um, so that's, that's what we're seeing so far in terms of changes after the, the pandemic. Excellent, so a lot of movement. Garrett, are you seeing similar movements in your market? Oops, you're muted. Thank you, sorry. Um, I would say uh, somewhat similar. Um, we have a, a pretty hot sales market as well, um, but I, I don't find a lot of people are getting rid of their properties. I think they're using it for opportunities and just bringing on more. So we've seen unprecedented growth this year as well. Are you making any significant de decisions around staffing to handle this growth 
or the, the changes in general that may cause a problem in the future if the market shifts dramatically again? Uh, we definitely are. I mean, it's hard to predict the future. I, I think for, for myself, it's just trying to predict, not even predict, just deal with the now, right? I mean, we, we, when you have that much growth happening, you can't ignore your current clients. So we have had to hire. I mean, if that means, you know, later on we have to hire more, that's fine. But I think just keeping up with the growth is the most important right now and make sure our other systems and processes don't suffer. So, and what are you, you're contributing this, this growth, it's kind of the assumption with this is that owners would wanna sell, but what are you contributing the growth to? I think, well, if I were to guess, at least in our market, maybe there's instability in other markets. People are just trying to get into real estate in general. For sure. Um, so when we're thinking about this and this, this change or that it, the market in itself is constantly changing, keeping a pulse on why owners decide to come on to your, into your business or decide to self-manage themselves, this is with these, in this turbulent market, it's really important to keep a pulse on that. Um, Tim, how well do you understand the factors that are driving your owners to stay or churn? He doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's not very nice. <clears throat> but I don't, no, I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> he no, knows probably more than all of us. Yeah, so we play, play, pay pretty close attention to why our uh, our owners leave, we actually have a kind of a tracking board that we use uh, as we do exit interviews. You know, you know, you don't always get the truth from your from your clients. Most people, it's easier just to say when you ask the question, "Hey, why are you leaving?" and is there something we can do to keep your business? Um, uh, it's easy to say, "Well, I'm just selling because the market's hot," or "I just need to get out of it." So, but we have actually found that we, if we engage our clients, we try to get some feedback from them and and send surveys out and, and understand why they're leaving. So, you know, we, we track it pretty well. I do want to go back really quickly uh, to the growth question, if I may. I'm going to do the worst Absolutely. thing you can do as a, in a panel and answer the question I want to, not the one you asked. <clears throat> um, but I think, I think it's interesting because we're also seeing a lot of churn, higher than normal uh, attrition, uh, as we call it here. Uh, but it's churn, uh, I think, is the industry standard. But we're also ahead of pace on growth as well. So, it create, it's creating some interesting dynamics that are out there. And how do you take advantage of that? Because money's cheap right now. People are wanting to get into real estate because they're seeing you know, people, people in their 30s have money right now. It's cheap money. And they're seeing, oh my gosh, look what the housing market was like in 2009 and look where it is now. Mm. Uh, that's a, a tremendous investment, even with the stock market doing what it's doing. So your original question was, what are you doing to try to prepare yeah. for the future. Well, we're trying to take advantage of that. So we're, we're doing things like we're starting brokerage. Mm -hmm. We've always been opposed to it. Uh, we've always thought, hey, we're going to be really focused in on property management. But, uh, but we decided that we were going to go after brokerage. So uh, in typical fashion, I answered all three of your questions, not just the one. So I apologize. I but, yeah. Perfect. So, Tim, I'm going to piggyback off you because I agree. Love piggybacking. Love a piggyback. A, you know, you have to. But, but um people are leveraging their current assets to go buy more. We're seeing some of the accidental landlords that just need to cash out, cash out. But if they don't need to cash out, they're hanging on to it because there's so much value in it, they're leveraging it to go buy more assets. So I, I, I'm with Tim on that one. I mean, you're, you know, there's no doubt we're all seeing the churn, but, but there's so much business coming in that you're either still going up or at a minimum, most people are at least staying flat. You know, you're not really seeing people's businesses go down. I haven't heard that from anybody yet. Um, I mean, I'm sure it's happening somewhere, but there are very few markets that aren't seeing an increase. Even the markets that were secondary markets three years ago, they're primary markets now because you can't get inventory in, in any of the major metros anymore. Uh, so yeah, you're, and it's all about relationships, right? So if they trust you, uh, they want to stay with you. So everything that we do is very relational. And that's like oh. really, oh, go ahead. I was just going to re-piggyback to the double, the double piggyback. If yeah. that's okay. But I think Jennifer brings up a good point just about engagement um, and, and how you're engaging your clients. And if you're, if, you know, whether you have staff or whether you're doing it yourself, um, you know, we're supposed to be trusted advisors for our clients. So when they come to you and say, Hey, I want to sell, I think that's the best option for me. Well, it might be right. But 
but equip yourself and, and, and your staff with the tools to have that conversation because somebody who sold six months ago, it probably wasn't in their best interest to sell six months ago because somebody who sold it a year ago, like their, their housing value in, in our markets, at least has gone up 16%. So it actually wasn't in their best interest uh, at the time. So I think it's important. You talked about preparing for the future, equip yourself, equip your managers with the tools to have the right in, in, and engaging conversations. It's our job is to teach them. Jumping in and going completely off my script as well, but an interesting thing that Tim had mentioned in the um, the average age of the owner is shifting now. And we've talked a long time at Property Meld about you know the residents becoming mainly millennial and how that changes the tools that you can use in the communication. But when we're looking at the shift in the owner market as well and who that demographic is, those become even more important when your customers are becoming millennials in that instant gratification in, um, demographic. What sort of tooling are you using to meet those needs of someone who previously probably didn't need as much communication or want as much transparency? And any, but that's one for the panel. So Garrett, if you wanna jump in on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, communication, I always say to my staff, uh, we're, we're not really selling property management services. I think history has kind of shown us that we're not some back room, uh, single person trying to manage this anymore. If we're not selling property management, I think there's a base service level there that a lot of other companies are doing. I think to really shine and, and set your company above the rest, what I tell my staff is we're, we're selling trust and trust comes from communication, um, as corny as that might sound. Um, and I know we're on the property meld panel here, but uh, you know that is one of the tools that we use. Uh, quick communication through a tool like property meld, any kind of instant messaging uh, system is integral, especially with the younger demographic. I mean, everybody wants instant gratification. And I think as the industry is going to move forward, property management companies have less time to communicate. The expectations are that it's almost instant. I mean, how do you even do that? Well, you have to use tech to leverage it. Absolutely. And one of the things that we hear as a rebuttal to that sort of transparency is that it can be a double-edged sword. We're often hearing owners want transparency, but the property management team in maintenance specifically feels like it can slow the process down. Is this something that you guys have to mitigate in your processes as you meet those needs, but still meet the needs of your staff to function fast? Yeah, so, oh, so just to, to go back to the question that you asked before too on the communication <laughs> side of things, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'll, I'll answer this question as well. Uh, <laughs> but I think for millennials specifically, but for everybody, Communication is just so important and streamlining that communication is also very helpful. Um, and I was talking to somebody at the IMN conference this week about what I love the most about property meld. And, you know, and obviously we're on a property meld panel here, but we love it. Like we, I, they asked me, would you ever go back? And I said, no, I mean, unless there's another functionality that, that allows us to do the exact same thing you, you all do. I don't see any reason to not, you know, continue to use your system because what it does is it takes the middleman out of it. It takes the property manager out of the middle of the contractor and resident uh, communication. Um, so you're talking about streamlining it as opposed to, you know, traditionally, if you put a work order in the system, a meld as you guys call it, you have to call the vendor and then schedule with the, the resident and there's no transparency of communication between those two parties. You don't know if that vendor ever called you don't know if the resident answered, uh, you know, and that just, that communication uh, is streamlined through property mode and you get to see the whole process. Add into that being able to keep it all in one place when you ask for approval from the owner of that property. Um, and it's just, it's such a smoother, uh, you know, maintenance uh, workflow. Um, it's just unbelievably better. So I can't imagine going back to you know, adding us back into that communication. There's just far too many opportunities for our team to drop the ball um, versus using, you know, your tool. And there's a lot of tools, out, there's a lot of tech tools out there that, that do similar things in different parts of our business. And they're all, you know, super important. Um, and 
to keep up with the competition, you, you need a lot of these, you know, bells and whistles, or you aren't going to be able to keep up with the, the, the competition. Not only that, but we're generally a reactive industry. So anything we can put in place and, and look, let's face it, maintenance is a reactive thing. So anytime you can put things in place to be as proactive on things as possible, it's what you want to do. So people want ease, they want transparency. So let tech go do what the tech should go do. So communication can be done that way. In some instances, it creates transparency, it creates efficiencies, it's immediate. And then let the people go do what people need to go do, which is build the relationships. Because if all a homeowner, you know, the only time they hear from their property manager is when something's wrong, that's not a positive experience for them. That's not a positive relationship. So what's going to stop them, the next maintenance issue that comes up when their tenant gives notice to vacate from leaving you to go to somebody else? They'll have a valued relationship with you because they feel like every time they hear from you, it's a negative circumstance. So put things in place to go create those efficiencies so that your people can get back to building that strong relationship. So we've done that where we, you know, we have proactive approaches within our teams where we're reaching out to owners for no reason, um, you know, on the anniversary date of when they sign their management agreement with us, they get a phone call, they get a gift sent to them. So there's things like that. So we're building that trusted relationship. So now when you call or have to reach out through whatever communication source, they're not as upset over that maintenance issue. They're still not going to be happy about it. Nobody likes spending money. But at the same time, they trust you. So they're not questioning that you're asking them to go spend $500. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this theme around this transparency and trust, everybody's pretty much in agreement on that, the importance there. Um, yeah. Do you feel at all, Tim, that that creates any amount of double checking from your owners on the work that you're doing? Does it create more work in that? Or is it giving them that peace of mind that is part of this? That you're hoping this strategy provides. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> I, in an ideal situation, and uh, by the way, as the only millennial on the panel, I'm a little bit insulted I didn't get asked or given the opportunity to answer. I know, and you question. like you. I know I've got the least hair. That one up for me too. So yeah. let's go ahead and give you the opportunity. No, no, it's, it's fine. No, 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 moving forward. Yeah, we can move forward. I've gone back already too much. But uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I think ideally, yeah. You, you automate something, you give people access to something so that you don't have to go back and uh, to answer that question later. It doesn't always happen. I mean, again, to millennials, yes, we love automation. We love tech. We love being able to do things on our own. But remember, we all graduated around the worst recession since the Great Depression. So we're all extremely anxious. We have the you know anxiety over everything. So mm -hmm. um we do like to double check things, but I think the ideal scenario is you give them the opportunity. And then to Jennifer's point, most, you know, most of the people are going to take the opportunity. They're going to, they're going to take that, uh, you know, uh, that step to go check for themselves and then not have many follow-up questions. But if even only half of the people do that, then you're opening your staff's time up to answer the questions of the other half. That might be a little bit more high maintenance. You're always going to have high maintenance clients, right? You're, you're dealing with, an enormous investment, the biggest investment of people's lives. So, uh, you know, you're always going to have those people that are going to double check, triple check, and they're going to want to talk to somebody because they just have that, that anxious feeling about the whole thing. So you're never going to be able to eliminate it completely, but you set it, you set it up so that they can go check on it themselves and that'll eliminate some of it for you. Yeah, you try to make those the outliers so that, exactly. you know, when, when you do have those coming in, your team has the bandwidth to go deal with it because that's never your customer service industry. It's never going to go away. Yeah, and it's creating that space so you can provide, understanding what Tim was saying, creating the space to provide the same customer service across the board to a broad range of demographics and having the yeah, time yeah. to do that. Exactly. I, lo I love the point that Jennifer made about, about engaging your clients with positive touch or just for the heck of it. Um, we do a lot of that. We try to do a lot of, uh, we call them good news videos. So anything good that yep. happens at your at your property, we do a, a quick Snapchat style video and send it to the owners through their their uh, management portal and text it to them and all that stuff. I, I love the idea of the, the gift on your anniversary of your management agreement. Uh, might want to do it right. Tim, before, I have to give you photos right because their... some of that I got from you. Some mm -hmm. of our positive stuff we've actually taken from you guys. So That's, so I'm I'm glad I could give you a nugget back. Well, I'm just saying, I'm yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that, but I'm gonna send it to them. <laughs> right before their renewal notice period. So they're more likely to stay off. Yeah. All right. So yeah. I'm going to take this back and then a little bit of a different angle. We're talking about your customers and who 
or your customers in the competition to bring on more. Are you feeling that right now with 21 million self-managed landlord, landlords self-managing, okay, let me do this again. 21 million units being self-managed by landlords today in the US. Are they your number one competition or is it other property management companies? Has there been a shift in that? Who you see as your main um, competition? I kind of butchered that question, sorry guys. <laughs> And Garrett, if you want to take this one, sure. I'm in the top um, of my screen, so I keep going back there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm in the top left, am I? Um, yeah, you know what? I think in terms of competition, I'm finding, I don't know about the other panelists, that there's a lot, again, that service level, there's a lot of new players coming in, um, and everybody at the outset looks the same. And if they're, if they're responsive, even if they're a one-person company and they're really in there, the client doesn't really know uh, what a larger company can offer or a smaller company. So I definitely find that the competition is stepping it up. Um, we used to be one of the only companies in our city that had over four stars on Google, and now there is several, right? Um, so I think, I, I think it keeps us honest. It keeps us in check, you know, um, regarding the other question about having self-managed landlords as competition. I'm finding there's a lot of people that are calling who are self-managed that want our services mainly because they don't have time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I mean, I probably attribute that to just people's lives getting busier and busier and maybe that's just what, what's happening, but we have a lot of people calling and just wanting to transfer over their properties just because they don't have time anymore. So it's not, it's no longer them thinking that they know better, which I think used to happen before. And they were kind of afraid of our industry. I think they accept our industry a little bit better now, but they just don't have the time. So they're willing to, uh, to transfer their assets over. Yeah, and I've, I've had some recent experience of that personally. I have a few friends that own and manage their own properties um, and they haven't used us for our services just because primarily because they're cheap. Right? And they are trying to, you know, eke every penny out of that asset. That, that being said, one of them recently called and said, literally, that maintenance, specifically the turn process, has become so hard that he's ready to turn it over to us. You know, they don't have any benefit of scale. Um, so when these vendors and the contractors are, are coming to choose who they're going to use, who they're going to spend their time with, who, uh, who gets their time when it's you know, the middle of summer and there's all kinds of work to be had. Um, and it's, it's us, it's the bigger companies versus the private homeowners. Um, and he said, you know, he's like, I can't get anybody to come over to the house to just give me a quote. And then they come over and they don't give me a quote. And so there's a, there's a lot of pain. I think that the uh, private landlords are feeling right now. Um, and we've actually gotten quite a few properties from private landlords. Um, you know, that are the same thing as Garrett was saying, I don't have the time. I'm having trouble, um, you know, and, you know, and I feel like there's just more money in our economy than ever before, you know? So I, I feel like people have money and they're like, okay, I can spend a little bit on property management to get this time back in my life. I think it's a demographic shift too. <clears throat> you know, the question before about millennials, a lot, a lot more of us are dual income households. Um, and so we have less time and, we're becoming investors in real estate at a little bit of an earlier age. So we have young kids or younger kids. And so that takes up a lot of time and uh, uh, is obviously a joy. Um, but, uh, you know, it certainly takes up a lot of time. So I, th I think it's a, it goes back to a demographic shift. So there's, you know, well, one, I have a question. Mike, was Tim one of the homeowners that's finally called you? To have you manage his property, <laughs> I saw him laughing. <laughs> the question was about the question was about competition, and and Mike is my competition. I'm afraid of Mike. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't blame you. But the you know, funny thing is, there's you know we all watch what our competition is doing, and look, several of us are all in the same markets, but at the same time, we're also friends. There's plenty of business to go around. We all share. I mean, we're sitting here sharing with you right now. Um, but to Tim's point, I think that you know landlords are, are getting to a point where they do want time back in, your, in, in their day. So we talked about creating that through technology for our teams. We are a solution for homeowners. Like there's problems out there. So the best way to go drive business is identify what the problems are for landlords and let them know how you can go solve that problem. They'll pay for that. People pay for efficiency. They pay for convenience. They, they, they pay for those types of things. So 
if you are solving problems for them, they don't view it as much, like Mike was saying, they don't view it as much as an expense. They're willing to pay for it as long as they see the value in it. Absolutely. So I think, you know, just kind of summing up the talk tracks for the last few minutes, historically we've seen that when the perceived cost of maintenance exceeds 10% of rent roll, that's when people start to split or they decide to self-manage. But right now the efficiency and the oversight and just the pure amount of time you can give back to a self-managed landlord that is outweighing that historic trend. Awesome. So when we're talking, um, you know, how do you, how are you marketing yourselves? How are you attain, attracting new landlord or new property owners to come to your company? Are you leveraging? What are your, your big leveragers? Do you, are you leveraging maintenance in that? Obviously that's where we want to go, but obviously people on the panel are interested in other avenues that you're using as well. Are you talking about attracting new customers? Yep, attracting new, yes. Does your biz dev have a strategy that's around maintenance? Are there other key players in their strategy? I think for our company, we're not really, it's like the other panelists said, it's about trying to take away pain points, but and we're not out there flaunting that we're doing maintenance better than anybody else. We're not flaunting that we do property management. I think most companies now it's about being present and being being on every, on the tip of somebody's tongue and and kind of being there that's what's worked in our market and we do a lot of social media um and and then i think when those discovery calls happen that's when you're answering the questions and finding out what the pain points are but I, for us at least our biz dev is is really done on a one-to-one -one basis it's not necessarily advertising that we have better maintenance communication or something like that i don't know that would resonate enough with a private landlord. So I think that, and I think Tim and Mike, I've seen them both doing this within their companies and, and it's it's what we've done a lot around here too. It's not so much that to, to Garrett's point, you're you know worrying about as much the one-offs, but you're trying to present your team, your firm as industry experts. So it's in social media presence, it's in you know videos, it's in delivering content um, where people see whether it's on social media or you're at local events or, you know, but you're positioning yourself as industry experts. So your name is out there. And that kind of has a tendency to drive it in more than just trying to reach out to the one owner at a time. So it's developing your brand, your following and putting yourself out there in a capacity that shows folks that you're industry experts. So it could be that you're, you know, almost in a sense, teaching them how to go do certain things. Um, because at some point in time, they're like, why am I going to go do this myself anymore? I'm going to go to the industry expert to do it for me. Absolutely. I think all that's right. I think <clears throat> maybe an, uh, an answer that is adjacent to your question is how are we closing business? And I think it goes back to ease. Like, obviously, I think we all have our own messages, right? We're all going through a lot of the same channels. And I think Jennifer brings up a great point about um, industry experts. But what are we doing to change the... I'm going to go to your living room in three nights from now and sit down with you at seven o'clock, tell you what your house is going to rent for um, and just sit down and take an hour and a half of your time. Nobody wants that anymore. Uh, I well, mean, not, not a lot of people. Reality want that anymore. with the market growing as it is, there's no time for that either. There's no, there's no time for that anymore. Exactly. First of all. Yeah. Every, everybody works 24 hours a day, essentially. Uh, we've all got multiple jobs in terms of families and kids and whatever you do on the side and, 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 and work. So what are you doing to make it really easy for somebody to sign up with you? Do they, can they figure out what's, what your value proposition is on your website? Are you competitive with the rest of your market in terms of what you're automating and what you're offering? I mean, you know, uh, and, and are you updating your value proposition to be in line with what it's supposed to be? So um, I think making it easy for people to sign up, making it uh, quick and efficient and, and automating as much of that piece of it is really important. I think if you flip it to, you know, retention, we always use the phrase in our office, retention is a sale, right? So keeping clients is as important as bringing on new ones. Um, so for us, we always use the phrase retention is a sale. Like anytime, you know, there's an owner and you, there's red flag warnings, you know, when it's coming. So, you know, kind of going back to hold the whole communication thing. You know, anytime a client has a maintenance issue over a certain dollar amount, there is immediate follow-up. There is, you know, a process we have in place to 
follow up with them to ensure that even though you just had this big maintenance expense, we're here for you. So it's continuing that relationship. So what are the things that you've put in place to sort of build that relationship with them? So, you know, we've added preventative maintenance. So we're, you know, we talk a little bit, but maintenance is probably the number one driver for tenants and landlords to leave you, mm -hmm. right? It's the most expensive and it's the most frustrating for all parties involved, including us. Um, so for us, we've, we've, you know, they don't all take us up on it, but we offer different preventative maintenance things proactively. So if they say no and they choose not to do it, that's on them. At least you're putting the offer out there. They can't hold you accountable for something they chose not to do. Um, so, you know, twice a year proactive, you know, most of us have many properties that are within HOAs proactively telling them, Hey, it's time for you to pressure wash your house again before the HOA tells them to go do that. Right. Cause that's, even though they won't get a fine immediately, it's a nuisance and, and you don't want to get that letter from your HOA. Um, you know, proactively twice a year, you know, cleaning up your yard, whether it's, you know, trimming the trees and bushes and, and putting new mulch down in the, in the flower beds, you know, just certain things that we've offered um, HVAC service contracts, pest control service contracts. Those are types of things that we've got relationships with our vendors that we go and offer out. And we have many owners that sign up for it. We have some that don't. And the first time something goes wrong on the HVAC, for example, and they didn't choose to have that preventative contract, all of a sudden they go and have the preventative contract. So, so what things are you putting in place as well to help retain those clients? Because it, without those relationships, without those things that you're putting in place, those maintenance issues are usually the biggest driver for terminations. Absolutely. So that kind of leads us into one of our questions from the panelists that, or the, um, the audience that I want to jump into because it was one of mine as well. And we all know, we've seen, Property Mill has been talking about it, the increase in invoice pricing. Like everything costs more. Vendors are hard to find. They're getting more expensive. The cost of materials are going up. Um, Alex asks, what's the standard repair expense ratio given the increase in price of materials recently? Is there anything you're doing to mitigate that cost? I'm not sure I know directly the answer in the difference in the statistics. I mean, we, we look at operating expenses as a whole and, and look at those trends. So I, I don't know that I have a great answer, a direct answer. I mean, I know that generally operating expenses are on a single family home all in can be 35 to 45%. I'm not seeing stuff jump outside of that. Some of the, some of the things at the lower end were creeping up a little bit. Uh, but I think for the most part, we're staying in that zone. Um, but yes, what we're trying to do to mitigate that, and that is we're doing a lot of in-house maintenance these days. We used to send everything out. Now we're trying really hard to hire internally. Um, and so we can control the pricing, at least of our labor there. Um, and so, you know, we're trying not to, we're recognizing the, the issue externally and trying to bring it in-house and solve the problem. So um, we're trying to push our in-house maintenance. We're trying to hire more maintenance people, which is hard as heck right now. Uh, but if we can control it and keep our clients costs down a little bit, what a value that is. And I love that Mike pointed out, you know, how hard it is. In fact, I wrote that down too, Mike, is are we selling our access to vendors, right? Like if we, if we, can, if we can control that a little bit and, and sell on that, that's a great way to attract clients. Uh, so anyway, we're internalizing some of the maintenance piece to try to control costs. That doesn't help on the material side, but we're just, again, we're, we're, we're controlling the labor side, which is also, I mean, that's, that may be going up more than lumber these days. Yeah, I, I would say um, maybe more so than increased costs, Alex, it's been like the, having the ability to get the supplies and, you know, uh, again, I think we have an advantage over private landlords as property managers because we kind of get first access to uh, things that you might normally have supply chain issues for, you know, uh, like basically, my, for example, I'm trying to put a fence in at my house, right? And I don't have much, uh, I don't have much pull as a single individual homeowner, um, but I have a fence that's, you know, 10 times the size going out on a property like next week because of the fact that uh, you know, there's more dollars behind that and more opportunity for future business. Um, same thing goes for appliances. You know, I'm hearing people saying, I'm not going to get my refrigerator at my house for the next, you know, 90 days or six months or one, the, one of the news reporters here in town said she didn't get hers for 18 months. 
Uh, and, you know, we had 15 refrigerators delivered to a multifamily property yesterday. So there's supply chain issues that uh, because we have kind of a bigger pull or, you know, kind of circumventing at this point, like, you know, that could, it could become a major problem. I don't know. I definitely don't have the crystal ball on that one. Uh, but right now it's more we can use to our advantage, you know, um, that, that use it as a selling technique, as Tim was mentioning, sales tool. Yeah, if I could um, just jump in there really quick. I think given the trends and in increases in maintenance and, and the almost daily phone calls I sometimes get from some of our owners just complaining about the costs, but I think, again, it's all about communication. I mean, the unless that investor is going to pick up the hammer and do it themselves, they probably aren't going to get it done any cheaper than some of our vendors. Um, what we're trying to do, at least in our market, is like we we exclusively just sub out all of our um our work um we're trying to have three or four vendors in every category um for electricians for plumbers for hvac people some large renovators and that not only gets us uh access to quicker turns and quicker contractors but it also keeps them in check so not only is our clients and you have to communicate this they're getting the benefit of bulk pricing overall but because I've got four electricians that's going to quote, and those four electricians know that there's three other electricians that are in there, it's keeping them honest. So if they want to work with our company, if they want to get uh, pre preferential treatment as well for payment, because they also get paid very, very quickly compared to you know chasing homeowners, um, they have to compete with each other. And that keeps the pricing fairly stable. So even though it's going up all across the board, um, again, unless they're picking up the hammer, they're probably not going to get much better pricing. That's excellent. Yeah, really um, insightful there. And Alex has another great question, and I think it's a good way to kind of like pull everything that we've said together. There's been a lot around communication and transparency and different strategies, but if you'd each kind of walk through and, um, and I can repeat the question after each of you go, but we'll start with Jennifer. The single bi biggest tool slash protocol you've used to ensure sustainable growth as it relates to new owners and properties. So if you were to sum up like one big nugget that you guys, or you could say a couple, we have time. So, um, and so this is really obviously biz dev related and, and that, you know, I mean, that shifts all the time. I mean, what worked two or three years ago doesn't, isn't the same model today. So you have to pay attention to what's going on around you. Pay attention to what others are doing uh, because, you know, that is going to be your key indicator on where things are going. I mean, I think a lot of us used to use, you know, APM years ago and Tim, Mike, you guys and Garrett, you you probably remember, you know, allpropertymanagement.com. Everybody was using that. Mm -hmm. It was a pay per lead. Um, wasn't great. But at the same time, it was kind of all that was out there at that point in time, because the, the whole idea of social media presence and all these videos and getting really creative with stuff like that, it wasn't there at that time. Uh, and, you know, the market then was shifting in a direction that was very favorable to investors. Um, so you didn't have a ton of primary buyers out there the way you do today. The market had slowed down. But enter updated technology, because that changes. I mean, what you bought yesterday is already outdated today. So you have to keep up with the time. So that shifts and you have to pay attention to it. So social media presence, getting more creative, being industry experts. I mean, I, I, I didn't have a process in place, you know, four or five years ago on trying to, you know, give nuggets of information out to accidental or, or self-managing landlords. But today that's a model that we kind of use and go with because if you can share information with them and they see that you are an industry expert and you are bringing value to them, that changes their mindset to shift over towards you. So it's, it's completely different today than it was when any one of us started in this business. You ready to take this, so, Mike or Garrett? Or yeah, sure. I just um, unmuted I our, single, our single biggest tool we, we use, Alex, is to, to ensure our sustainable growth is is really relationships, um, you know, and I, Jen and Tim are probably sick to hearing me talk about this. Yeah, but we, I am. <coughs> yeah. But we don't, 
we don't spend money on advertising. So our growth all comes from referrals from realtors and brokers and other investors. Um, and Go, going uh, to the yeah. bar is a type of advertising, just FYI, spending money at the bar. So you do it's spend money on advertising. You just get to think. Yeah. And an effective hiring strategy a lot of times. Uh, so, um, you know, for, for us, it's just relationships, Alex, we have good relationships with realtors and brokers and, and that's really been our biggest tool. Um, over time, uh, you know, tech has played a role in that. Um, over time, we've become the number one, you know, property management company in terms of SEO. Um, so tech wise, you know, we've PMW for our website. I think a lot of the people on the call do too. Um, and they just have a lot of built-in SEO on the back end that has really helped us out long term. Um, but but really before that, before we had gained that steam, it was just relationships. And so I, I always go back to that in default too, uh, knowing realtors, knowing brokers, um, and knowing investors in the market. You're right, Mike. That part of it has never changed, and it, it truly is about the relationships too. I would say for us. <clears throat> I don't know if this is a tool. Mike took all my answers, but uh, which is why, which is I saw him on mute and I tried to unmute faster. That's why I knew he was going to do it. Uh, but I think, you know, I mentioned earlier kind of the ease and the quick the quickness of our sales process. I think we do an inside sales process uh, where we've got somebody who is on the phone doing demos via Zoom on the phone. So you can literally do a 15 minute demo on your lunch. You can call in and do a 15 minute demo and sign up right there during your lunch break. I think that has helped us with the sustainable organic growth. Um, and then this is kind of an abstract answer, but I think our process around surveying our clients and figuring out what we're, um, excuse me, screwing up um, is really big. Changing our processes, finding out where we're good, where we're bad, and having a really good understanding of that. Um, has helped us uh, grow because we're on top of, of, of changes. We're on top of what our clients' needs are. And so we, we know what we should be selling to. Yeah, I might just add to that. Um, when we're talking about tools, Alex, I mean, at least for my company, single biggest hands down uh, video, um, use of video. Um, I, my, my very, very quick story, I, I bought out my business partner three or four years ago, changed my company name to rebranded, scared like you wouldn't believe that I'm dumping a 20 year old name. Um, and I just said, okay, I'm gonna commit to one video a week, two minutes or less. I'm just gonna keep it going, it has to be consistent. And I can't tell you how many times, and I'm just answering questions. I basically pulled all my staff and said, give me every question that's ever been asked to you and I'm just gonna answer it on video. And so many times when I'm speaking to new investors, they're like, oh, I, I feel like I know you already. And you know, there's, there's this issue of trust. We're building a relationship when I don't even have to be there. And the second point is videos are sticky. They're there and somebody can watch it over and over and you can leverage it. So even though it might take you a couple hours to get a video out there, it's out there forever. Like the internet never forgets. And if you are able to leverage social media appropriately to do that, um, at least for our company, hands down, that is the single biggest tool that's uh, been responsible for our growth. That's great. Well, you know, with Property Meld, we love hearing about all of these things. They play really well into what we're trying to do and um, just summing everything up and really looking into how to build these, this trust and how to leverage that to continue to grow and scale and sustain through really whatever market, whether it's up or down moving fast. So you guys are all doing a great job with that. Alex had one more question. And this was more specifically to give context to your answers, I believe. Um, the, what is the ratio between the amount of people on your team and the amount of doors you manage? So this kind of gives, this would have been a good thing to probably give to context in at the beginning. So they, so our viewers could understand a little bit more about you guys, but did someone pay Alex to ask all the questions? I know. I he wanted to keep hire busy. Alex to be on all of these panels with me because this has been great. It's actually it's just Ray with the name Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Probably that's awesome. I actually thought that for a minute. <laughs> I, 
can go first. Uh, we have right now we have we manage about twenty five hundred properties and we have fifty employees. So we're about one employee for every fifty doors that we manage. Now it's kind of it might be a little skewed because we have uh, multifamily, um, but at the same time that ratio pretty much stays true on the multifamily side of things because typically for every hundred units you have you have a maintenance person and a office worker. Um, so the ratio holds pretty true in multifamily as well. It's about one person for every 50 doors. So we're a little bit different. We're probably about 100 to 1. Um, but our structure is sort of a hybrid of portfolio and departmental. And because of that and, and different technology pieces that we use that has elevated that, we probably were more of a, a 50 to 75 to 1, you know, two, three years ago. Um, but the more you can put in place to create efficiency, um, we have redundancy in our roles, the way we've set up our team structure. So, you know, it can kind of help, uh, someone goes away on vacation. There's somebody else that can help backfill that rather than one property manager with a certain number of doors in their portfolio when they go on vacation or God forbid you have some turnover, nobody can do anything because everybody else is so covered up that you, um, are covering emergencies only. And that's yet another reason that homeowners want to go leave you. So, we've put things in place and created an environment where uh, we, we sort of have redundancy in the roles and we've created efficiencies so we can elevate that number a little bit, but still keep their uh, work at a manageable level. Um, I guess I'll go next since Tim is still uh, muted. <laughs> Each of there, buddy. Um, we, uh, we exclusively manage singles, um, chosen not to be in the multis. I was in multis uh, years ago. Um, our ratio is pretty pretty skewed i think to the other side i mean we're about 35 to 40 to one um i've chosen to go that heavy uh, i know i've heard of you know 400 unit um companies that are managing with four or five people um i i just find that by going heavy on the on the labor uh it allows for more i guess not efficiencies but better communication which is i i kind of look at it as my marketing budget it sounds kind of weird that way um but but that's the way i look at it and i've i've been forced to go to a lot of remote labor to be able to keep my profit margins you know between 10 and 20 percent that's really the only way i found that i can do it and if COVID has done anything um you know going completely paperless digital uh i think involving remote professionals is easier than ever and we've definitely leveraged that Excellent. Yeah, so um, I'm trying to do math real quick because we're shifting around. Can I answer the question in a different way? Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. That's okay with Alex, our professional question asker. Yeah, so <laughs> just, you know, I'm going to tell you what we try to do and why we try to do it. But we, we try to have teams of three manage 350 units. Um, and so when you look at that, that's like 115, one, uh, 115 units per person or something right around there. I'm bad at math. Um, <laughs> however, we we take a lot of stuff off their plate. Like we have a virtual assistant that does renewals. Uh, we're working in uh, an administrative virtual assistant on all of our teams that we're, we're experimented with and I think we're gonna go with it. So we have this pod structure where our management teams are three people for about 350 units. We've got some that are 380 and, and a few that are a little bit lower, but we try to be around 350. And then we take out lease renewals, uh, trying to add a little admin support. Um, and then business development is separate. And we have an accounting support person for our six six teams at this point on the, on the single family side. Um, and we're structured like, very, my, very similarly. It's that, that's, yeah. you know, and you and I are usually, you know, over the years, we've been very in, in alignment on a lot of those things, but our structure mm -hmm. is almost identical to what you're describing. Yeah. yeah, same with us. So, so, also... so is Mike's. <laughs> so we just got me Tim. So I just structure very similarly also. Yeah, we're also using the pod structure of three. So that's very interesting. I just, and I just chose to actually answer the question. It might have been a little strategic when I planned the, the yeah, panel. Yours, <laughs> your answer didn't even make any sense, Mike. 50 per door, but multifamily, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I was, and no, it's, it's yep. just answered it with the ratio that he requested. Well, we're kind of wrapping up towards the end of the hour. The hour and I want to thank everybody for joining us on our first 
um, webinar, especially our panelists, Alex, for your excellent question. <laughs> And um, we definitely want to keep this conversation alive. So I do invite everyone to grab that link, head to Facebook, and share your own personal experiences around a lot of the conversations we've had here, and um, post any additional questions you have, and save the date for August 19th. We'll be doing our next forum on um, internal text and building a really strong internal maintenance. And that really cues into what we were saying earlier about what Tim was saying, they're making that transition because the cost of labor is high and unpredictable right now. So look forward to that discussion and seeing everybody again. <laughs>